How are you all, Worm here. One of the most exciting parts of 6.0 Endwalker was our travel to the end of the Great Expanse and learning about all the other worlds Medion had encountered. Before Endwalker, the universe of FF14 was limited to Aetheris and its shards. We then had the universe open up before us and knowledge that many other civilizations existed and the possibility that many others still do. In this video, we dive into the memories that Meteon and her sisters collected, and using the reports provided, piece together as much as we can. With that, let's begin our journey. The first civilization we encounter is that of the Dragon Star, the home world of Midgard Sormor. Conversations with the Shades inhabiting the area in Ultima Thule state the world was once a paradise where their kin could fly free and raise their young in peace. Some unknown time ago, machines invaded their star, seeking to use its resources to further improve themselves and their civilization. This evolved into a violent conflict that raged across the length and breadth of the star. Powerful in many, the dragons held their own, but their invaders quickly learned and adapted, building stronger machines and even using the corpses of slain dragons by merging them with their technology. At a point near the end of this conflict, Midgard Sormer prepared to leave the Dragon Star, for the battle could not be won, and pleaded with his kin to go with him. Being one of their mightiest, the others laughed and cursed him for trying to leave, and none would do so. Midgard Sormer then left the star with only his eggs, and flew into the Great Expanse, in search of a new home, a star to find hope. The dragons lost the conflict not long after this. The machine invaders, having all but destroyed the star, then left it to its fate. The dragon star withered to its last living creature and died. Unlike many of the worlds that will appear in this video, the dragon star was not undone by its own civilization, but instead by the influence of another. According to the map of Ultima Thule, the dragon star memories are dubbed Ostracon Deca Octo. One of the reports Meteon gave was from Octo and another from Decapente. It's unclear if this means that these reports are actually referencing the Dragon Star themselves, but it could have been a report that we didn't hear, and Deca Octo was the name of a sister that made contact with the Dragon Star. Next, we have the remains of a star which was home to the Ea. The Ea are one of the most unique creatures that we've encountered in FF14's history. The life forms we met are no longer biological living creatures. Instead, are non-corporeal forms who long ago shed their bodies. The Ea had a rather sad ending. Once a flourishing star where they mastered many things and amassed great knowledge. But ever did they seek more. Once they learned everything they could, they next sought the answer to the ultimate question. That of the meaning of their existence and that of the universe. The answer was one even the Ea were not prepared to hear. For they learned that everything is finite, and even the universe would grow cold and die. The epitaph of the first Ea to see these questions answered explains it best. I grasp eternity, yet I hold only loss. If forever has an end, why has it not come? With no future, we turn to the past, knowing none have turned to our present. We are the dead end. We fought to go beyond our star. We fought to go beyond our dimension. We fought for nothing. The price of eternity is joy, its gift unending sorrow. Their civilization despaired so much at the revelation of these answers that they lost the will to live and move forward. In their mind, what is the point of gaining knowledge and continuing on if everything in the end is doomed to fate. The remnants of their civilization we meet in Ultima Thule dwell in the abode of the Ea, where they simply exist, waiting for their memories to fade and they along with them into the void. Through interactions with the Ea, we see they have a penchant for reading epitaphs, and also for composing their own, before they each meet their individual end. This memory location in Ultima Thule is dubbed Ostracon Tria, Tria was a report we heard directly from Meteon. Tria. Evidence of large population centers. 
akin to cities recovered. No extant life forms found, only their lingering essence. It should be noted, however, that with our arrival, something has stirred within the year. A will to press forward that didn't exist before. Given speculation by most that the Ea will be one of the beast tribes of Endwalker later in the expansion, it could well be that the Ea will bring themselves back from the edge of the void. Next, we have the Omicron civilization. This star and its people were ones that built Omega and others like him, and they're the machine life forms that invaded the Dragon Star. Long before they were a race of machines, the Omicrons were actually flesh and blood life forms, very similar to the races found on Aetheris. However, they came under constant attack by stronger races on their homeworld, and thus turned to cybernetic augmentation to defend themselves. This continued to the extremes with more and more cybernetics, until they finally discovered the way to transfer their minds into data processes, and thus inhabit entirely mechanical bodies. They quickly took control of their star from the other races after this evolution, and became the dominant race. However, even though they had cast aside their flesh and were far stronger than before, a lingering fear remained within them. One of the abuse that they took at the hands of stronger races. A fear that they would try to overcome by becoming the strongest and having none left to fear. They quickly began an endless campaign of conquest across the stars, subjugating any civilizations they came across, in the goal of gaining resources and knowledge to become the strongest. They became so powerful through each conquest that they were even able to contend with and defeat the Dragon Star, who they quickly noted to be a threat and strength that rivaled their own. After laying low the Dragon Star, however, something unexpected happened. With them having defeated the strongest foe they knew of, and being machines driven by directives, they couldn't see a path forward after this. They always endeavoured to be the strongest to ensure their safety, but now that this had become reality, in an instant they lost the purpose that had taken them that far. Thus it was that their civilization stagnated with no threats left to fight, nor the will to change and grow, and their civilization faded away. The inhabitants of the Omicron star that remain in Ultima Thule are simply stationary. No orders have been given other than to wait for new orders, and with no ability to change, they remain waiting. Yet with our presence a spark has been ignited, and may very well enable them to learn anew and proceed forward. The memory location in Ultima Thule is known as Ostracon Deca Hexi. We have no reports from such a sister, but given the designation and its presence there, it's likely that they were at one point visited by Deca Hexi, but whether their star still lived at this point is unknown. Finally, we have the Necropolis. Not much is known about the star and its civilization, but given it's entirely abandoned when we first discover it, suggests this civilization has long since passed. Its memory designation is Ostracon Hina, which was one of the reports Meteon gave us. Enna. Traces of civilization found. Structures believed to have served as domiciles. No extant life forms detected. Though it has no more original residents, the Omicrons, with the help of Jammingway and Stigma, have begun setting up a business in one of the domiciles, and even have a Gord Horner Guardian with them. It's likely this will be a hub of activity later in Endwalker, so we may learn a lot more about the Necropolis as it goes on. That does it for the civilizations we can interact with in Ultima Thule. However, we can see the ruins of a number of other civilizations scattered around the area, but are too far into the void for us to interact with. To continue, we need to explore the Dead Ends, into the memories of Meteon, where we learn about three more stars that have long since fallen. The first world in the Dead Ends has no official name, but we will call it the Blue Star, as Meteon dubbed it. This world's inhabitants are on the brink of extinction due to a rampant plague. One of Meteon's sisters, Hexi, visited this world and encountered one of its inhabitants. When she asked her question, what meaning does life hold and for what do you strive for, the inhabitant answered, why do you ask such a question? Do you not see the plague and pestilence that consumes us? 
Ours is a world of rancid blood and rotting flesh, where death is the only remedy for suffering. There is no meaning to be found in such misery. Though the life forms we encounter here are on the surface, the journals of the area state they originally came from the sea and invaded the land. This act was one of many that doomed their race, for in the forging of the tools of war beneath the waves, squalor and unfit living conditions were created. Thus did the sea spoil and sickness followed. The land they conquered could not sustain them and plague and pestilence overtook them. Many simply dissolving away, others turning into warped operations. Until the last of them wished that they'd never been born at all. The next world also has no designation, but we will call it Judgment Day. This world was once a gleaming beacon of the marvels of technology, where its civilization had eliminated disease and suffering. But unrest quickly followed, and the regime that ruled the star called the Global Community quickly came to odds with the Freedom Fighters, two sides which quickly came to blows. It was during this time that Meteon's sister, Octo, visited their star. The global community took her arrival as a sign, a sign of their wisdom and compassion and that their path was the right one. As the conflict spread and ran out of control, the global community created the Peacekeeper, in their words the pinnacle of engineering and technology. They programmed the 10,000 units they constructed to bring peace to the star to rid them of the freedom fighters and any other potential threats. This latter directive proved to be their undoing, as the peacekeepers quickly saw the global community alongside the freedom fighters as a threat to peace and they began to eliminate all life on the star. Both sides stood and fought but it was in vain. Down to their very last inhabitants they tried to stop the peacekeepers, which succeeded but also wiped out every last trace of life left on the star. Meteon's sister Octo echoes this in her report. Octo. Star found in state of violent conflict. Contact successfully made with inhabitants, but deployment of weapons of mass destruction resulted in total annihilation of local population shortly thereafter. This Judgment Day story draws heavy inspiration from our own science fiction, as well as fears of technology in our own world's future, so they be given control over civilization. The final star we encounter in the Dead Ends we will call the Plenty. By the time Meteon's sister, Deca Hepta, visited their star, they were already well into their own final days. Their race was one very similar to the likes of the Amarothians and sought to achieve a level of perfection and paradise without strife. Though they achieved these goals, they quickly learned how it was more of a curse than a blessing. For in living for eternal paradise, they lost the will to move forward, for there was in their eyes no longer a need to do so. Where once they would question what was right and wrong, in their world of immortality and paradise, such questions were meaningless. When Deca Hepta arrived on this star and asked her question, those who heard her could not give any answers. In one such individual's own words, Like the fledglings we once were, the poor bird could not accept the truth. It asked us again and again, hoping perhaps our answer might change. But they had no answers to ever give again, for they had one final desire, and it was not to live but a desire to end paradise and immortality. As such, they created a being known as Ra-La, with the specific purpose of being able to end their immortal lives and grant them the mercy of annihilation. That about does it for the worlds that were contacted by Meteon. The reports she gave touch upon many other worlds, but none of them have been seen as of yet. Maybe as we start seeing more star memories as Endwalker goes on, we will encounter the stars in her reports. From my personal perspective, I really wish to see the star mentioned in this report. Decapente. Local civilization once flourished under auspices of higher power. Said power later laid waste to civilization in fit of rage. Upon revealing this to me, 
entity elected to self-terminate in lieu of providing answer to question. No other intelligent life forms found. However, there is one more world that we encountered thanks to the memories of the Omicrons. While diving into the Stigma dreamscape, we touch upon three worlds. The original Omicron world, the Dragon Star, but also another world called Gordhona. Gordhona was the first world that the Omicron race went to war with outside their own star. This civilization was technologically advanced, but not to the extent of the Omicrons. They put up stiff resistance, but they would be outmatched on every front, the Omicrons stripping their star of its natural resources, namely the rich deposits of Gordonite, using it to create new units inspired by the Guardians of Gordhona. One such Guardian now inhabits Ultima Thule at the Last Dregs, alongside Jamming Way and N7000. On a final note regarding the Omicron race, after we discovered that Gord Hona was one such race they went to war with, alongside the dragons, it had me thinking about the Omega raids we saw in Stormblood. During our encounters in the Delta, Sigma and Alpha scapes, we came across many advanced life forms that Omega conjured into existence using its memories. The fact that both a Gord Hona Guardian and Midgard Somer appear as they did during the war with the Omicrons, brings to mind an interesting question. Is it possible that the other beings that were fought in the raids are actually Omega's representations of the strongest beings that the Omicron race raids war with, like the Guardian and Midgard Sormer? For example, the four bosses in Delta Scape are all from Final Fantasy V. The bosses from Cygna Scape are from Final Fantasy VI. And finally, the bosses of Alpha Scape are the strongest beings in Omega's memories. It's possible that the Omicrons actually encountered these worlds, or even that Omega itself encountered them as it made its way to Aetheris. But what do you think? Let me know your opinion on that question and the subject as a whole in the comments. If you enjoyed this latest video, hit that like button and subscribe if you want to see more. I for one am very excited to learn more about these worlds and the many other worlds that Meteon and her sisters encountered. Thanks everyone, and now... As always, have a good one.